Good morning, everyone. Um, it's fantastic. Everyone's wishing everyone good morning on the chat. I think that's brilliant. Hope everyone's okay. Uh, welcome to our latest webinar in this ADHD Awareness Month of October. Uh, we are discussing ADHD and understanding ADHD in the workplace. Uh, my name is Andy Rigby. I am the regional manager uh, for the North for Posturite and also our enablement lead, which specializes in assessment solutions and training within the field of neurodiversity and disability. Bit of housekeeping, just to let you know the whole uh, session, including the Q&A, will be recorded. So do get your questions in in the chat box. box. Uh, if we can request that these are kept quite general rather than discussing specific cases, obviously with the with the with the session being recorded, that would be great. The recording and the slides will be made available to you later on this week by email. Um, we expect we've had quite a number of questions already. So if we don't answer your query or question, we will reach out to you individually. And likewise, our contact details will be displayed at the end of the webinar. So you can reach out to any of us with specific queries, of course. We have some great speakers for you, which I will shortly introduce, but just to set the scene we've had a fantastic response from everyone on this webinar to listen to learn and to add value to the conversation around adhd which i think is fantastic to spread awareness encourage the conversation and, and look into how people are implementing clear processes to help people understand both traits in themselves and also recognition and understanding the traits in other people uh, things that I've learned uh, is ADHD is, is obviously very real, it's, it, it's common, it, it can be complex for some people and it, it can have a, a real impact in the workplace, both positive impact and potentially a challenging impact if the individual is either unaware or left without some assistance if they need it. So creating this conversation and creating this awareness to so many people for us is really exciting today. Uh, I've also had quite a few conversations with people that I know that are on the call where a lot of this may not just be awareness in their professional capacity. But there are a lot of personal stories around ADHD with friends and families or, or even themselves, which we may touch on this morning also. So to our webinar, we are delighted to be joined by Hazel Leefield and Daniel Cady, both from the Business Disability Forum. Uh, Hazel has over 25 years of experience delivering recruitment and HR solutions to both public and private sectors and currently leads a team of expert senior disability partners for the BDF, combining experience of working with large complex organisations and knowledge of talent management and disability best practice to support and advise BDF partners during their disability smart journey. Dan, also a senior disability business partner at the BDF like Hazel, and Dan supports many organizations on their journey to become disability smart and have ex focused extensively on accessibility and inclusion in business. Dan also has experience with the National Autistic Society leading the autism friendly business team and sits on the independent accessibility panel for Gatwick Airport. And lastly, David Mitchell. David joined Postrite earlier this year and has over 20 years experience uh, working as an assistive technology provider and helps implement technology solutions for people with disabilities in education and workplaces. David is skilled in disability support, consultancy, coaching, management and HR, and will feature in our Q&A section shortly. Uh, there should be a Q&A box at the bottom of people's screens, by the way, um, for people to, to send the, the, the questions in. Um, be aware that your question will be visible to everyone attending the webinar within the chat box function. Uh, and lastly, before I hand over, if you are not already on Posturite's mailing list for invitation on future webinars, you can sign up at posturite.co.uk forward slash subscribe. So I will now hand over to Hazel and Dan, who can um, perhaps introduce who the Business Disability Forum are and how they can help within this field. Thanks very much, uh, Andy, for the introduction. And, uh... Morning to everyone. It's uh, great to be here. I know this is a um, subject very close to the hearts of both Hazel and myself. Uh, just to give you a bit of an idea on the Business Disability Forum, if you don't know us, we're the leading business membership organisation in disability inclusion. Uh, we work in partnership with both business, uh, government and disabled people, um, all to remove barriers uh, around inclusion. Uh, we've got nearly 500 members uh, last count. That's uh, over 20% of the UK workforce and I think around about 8 million people worldwide um, who we support both with uh, resources and our work around uh, policy as well. Uh, so to get to the subject today of um, ADHD, if we could have the first slide, please. 
So what is uh, ADHD? So it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, a uh, developmental condition, uh, which is thought to be present from birth and is lifelong. Um, it's a neurobiological spectrum condition, so it affects attention, impulses and concentration. Um, and I think the, the name itself can sometimes be a little confusing to people uh, because it's actually symptoms are divided into two categories. So inattention and hyperactivity or impulsivity. Um, I think a lot of people do tend to, with some knowledge of ADHD, tend to lead towards thinking it means just that hyperactivity, but it can actually uh, identify in very different ways uh, in individuals uh, that have the condition. So some of those behaviours that, um, that can include uh, difficulty concentrating, um, being restless or anxious or appearing to others to be unorganised. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So does that make uh, ADHD a disability? Uh, well, ADHD comes under the umbrella of uh, neurodiversity, um, neurodiversity relating to um, behaviour of the brain and behavioural traits. All of these are uh, variable within um, every single person. Um, but the way we work, we work under a the, the basically the Equality Act, Equality Act 2010, uh, a disability is classed to be a disability if it has a substantial uh, detrimental impact on someone's everyday activities, so their ability to be able to um, complete day-to-day uh, -day activities, and substantial there means anything more than trivial. Uh, so yeah, um, under the Equality Act as well, an employer has a a duty to make reasonable adjustments for someone who is facing a barrier at work um, or if they could be reasonably expected to know that the employee has a disability um, and that where, that's where it comes into then thinking of um, ADHD as something that you, know, you may find barriers at work it, that will those barriers themselves will be what I'm creating a disability if you like um, by having that negative impact on your ability to be able to complete activities. Uh, go to the next slide please. So how might ADHD appear in the workplace? Uh, well, there's, there's some of the common traits that we find are difficulty in organising a workload or uh, with time management and prioritising tasks, um, procrastination um, and difficult, difficulty making decisions, um, starting or completing a task. Quite often it can be starting a task and then sort of seeing it through seeing it through to the end um, can, can become an issue. Uh, appearing distracted or losing focus, um, missing details or forgetting things. And then problems with working and short-term memory. So a lot of this can come from, if you think of a, a, a brain which is moving very quickly and is focusing lots on, on lots and lots of different things. So your, your working in short-term memory is then affected by that because you, it, it, it's buzzing around and it is trying to focus on an awful, awful lot of things. And if you think about the world we live in at the moment, um, you know, aside from uh, global pandemics and um, issues in, in Europe and cost of living, there's an awful lot for uh, the, the, the ADHD mind to be jumping around and focusing on uh, before it's even getting down to day-to-day -to -day tasks. Um, and that, that, seeming lack of focus can then uh, come into how we might sort of see people having difficulty in retaining conversation um, and, and the, the want to sort of be able to be part of conversation can then lead to some sort of impulsivity. So again, the ADH mind wanting to, wanting to speak, possibly out of turn or to interrupt or be excessively talkative. And uh, that, again, runs into the hyperactivity, which can lead to struggling uh, with following directions. All things that, you know, if, if, especially if there's a little understanding, uh, can have a negative impact for that individual within the workplace. Uh, give me my place. So how can we support in, in the workplace? Um, the, the key that we work for really is to be able to anticipate barriers and make changes. And that's really because we work under a uh, social model of um, disability in recognising that actually a lot of the barriers that are in the workplace are because they've been constructed around a perceived uh, normality or a perceived um, neurotypical uh, way of way of working. So actually, we can look at some of those barriers and start to make changes to remove them. Uh, and in some cases, for everyone. Uh, could the next slide, please? 
So yeah, the barriers that we see in the workplace, the uh, uh, processes, uh, practices, sometimes just the physical environment uh, that leads to an individual being less effective um, in their role without reasonable adjustments being made. Uh, so as I was saying, that's considering that a person being disabled by their environment rather than um, any of their, con their condition actually disabling them. So if you think about having a, a noisy open plan office, uh, lots of distractions, where it could be sitting by a window, sort of sitting by fans, lots of noise, even um, other people around them. Uh, if you ever work with a culture of tight deadlines, deadlines that can move, that can move at the last moment, um, how is that individual managed? And then also an inability to access supportive technology or processes because there are um, different bits of technology and processes that are out there that can actually help a lot of people with ADHD. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so looking at reasonable adjustments that organisations can make, I think it's important to slightly tweak the conversation around reasonable adjustments. Um, the, an adjustment isn't something that an employee, the owner should be on the employee to come to an employer and ask for. A lot of individuals might not know that some adjustments are even available. Um, so if we start to think of as adjustments as performance tools that can help individuals, um, we should be asking all employees, how can we help you to work to your, um, to your best, to your full potential uh, within your role? And so some of those adjustments that you might find for an individual with ADHD are thinking about things like extra time to prepare for meetings and presentations, making sure that time is, is blocked in. Uh, think about physical space in, in the work environment. A lot of uh, offices now are having either quiet spaces, um, using meeting pods, particularly post-COVID, using different ways to use that space so it works for all individuals. Uh, choosing communication methods that suit the individual. Uh, so sometimes it's better to either have written in instruction again in the way that we're working now. Do people want to be using uh, things like Zoom uh, or Teams uh, or do they want that backed up with some sort of written instruction that will go through a task as well? Uh, that goes then into technology and methods of working and breaking some tasks down into smaller chunks. So again, thinking about what does the individual like? How do they work best? Um, and also being able to provide that written communication for any sort of lengthy information, not just relying on someone to be able to either have their own notes or to have taken all conversation in, and then being able to check information instructions have been captured. So that's just some of the reasonable adjustments, certainly not a cookie cutter approach to that is for every single person with ADHD, uh, but those are some of the uh, common adjustments that we'll end up dealing with. And uh, now I'd just like to hand over to my colleague, Hazel. I think it's going to take us through the next part of the presentation. Hi, thank, thanks, Dan. So, yeah, we, so we've, we've heard about, you know, reasonable adjustments and the things that we can put in place to remove those barriers that, that impact performance. And basically, as Dan said, things, things that uh, stop someone delivering to their best work. So we've got a few examples. Um, I know Dan's touched on some of these. So in more detail, I mean, these are things that we can all do, not, not just line managers, but colleagues of, of um, us, ourselves that, that possibly um, we may know or we may not know, but these are some of the things that we, we can generally do that are going to support anyone that has um, ADHD or, in fact, um, you know, some form of inattention um, or, or possibly hyperactivity. But it's supporting... Um, with the planning of tasks. So ADHD, because of the inattention element of the condition, it's how do you make things simple in terms of the process that you go through and the planning. And that comes down to how you take in the information and how you retain it so that you can recall that information later. So any support with planning tasks is always going to be helpful. I think Dan mentioned you know, breaking things down into smaller smaller pieces of work is often really helpful. Sometimes it might be changing hours of work um, or scheduling particular duties at, at particular times. Some uh, individuals with ADHD do take medication to help uh, with um, some, of the, uh, some of the impact of that. And that might have an impact on when they are uh, able to be more focused depending on when the medication is taken and those kinds of things. So that's also a consideration. And um, note taking, really, really fairly straightforward uh, thing that you can do to 
enable people to really keep focused and also keep a track of what's gone on is note taking and the ability to um, or give the freedom to be able to record meetings and discussions. The big thing about ADHD is it's not a controllable, it's often not a controllable intention. So it's not that the individual becomes bored and fidgeting and decides to you know, refocus on something else. The focus is lost and often that information blackout can occur. But it has been noted many people that have ADHD find that if they're able to take handwritten notes or type on a laptop, um, to record information that the very fact of doing that allows the brain to focus on what, what is being said in the meeting. So quite a simple thing. Um, recording sometimes is not always possible depending on what's being discussed, but it's really something that, that could be considered as reasonable um, if, if possible. Short breaks, again, pretty well um, recognised that Lots of small short breaks really does help to refocus on the task in hand. And again, Dan's talked about time and space uh, to complete work. If there is a deadline, you know, have a look at the flexibility that you have in the available space to give, give someone that, that kind of away time to, to focus on that. Um, yeah, additional time to process information, especially as we said previously in the slides, if someone's being asked to do a presentation, they may need more time to prepare in advance just because of um, sometimes the speed of processing information can take longer. Many people with ADHD will reread, re-review content several times to, to get it really embedded. Um, but the bottom line is be led by the individual. It's all about discussing what that particular person finds helpful and the type of communication that helps them retain that information. I think we're moving on to the next one. So we've all got a role to play here, um, both in work and in society, and it's, it's about more of us accepting anyone, others that, that appear different to us. And let's face it, we're all different anyway. Um, so it, it's absolutely about all of us. We can all make a difference to um, our colleagues that, that maybe are facing some of those barriers. And often it's just a conversation. And I think Dan uh, kind of mentioned earlier that it's from BDF, it's very much a focus on the barriers, focus on the things that is getting in the way or uh, impeding someone from being able to perform the best that they can, rather than necessarily always trying to get to the bottom of what the condition is is there a diagnosis because we know often that just isn't the case many many people have spectrum conditions that are not diagnosed and actually the reason we go for diagnosis quite often is two things firstly it may be that um, that person really wants to understand why they tick a certain way and they find it quite empowering to, to understand you know, the differences in how they process information and the way that they learn. Um, but we do live in a society where diagnosis is, especially as you're coming through the education system, it is how you get support. Um, we still have that, that medical model of diagnosis for certain things. So diagnosis absolutely has its value, but we need to recognize that some individuals maybe just don't don't want to have that diagnosis. They just want to be able to perform better in their role. So it's about focusing on what are those, what are the barriers to, to people performing at the best they can. And it's about not being not being afraid to get things wrong. You know, we we're very, very mindful of language these days. Um, and it's really important about building knowledge and, and building confidence through knowledge on how to uh, talk to our colleagues about things that may be um, barriers. But at the end of the day, it's so much, so much more um, uh, beneficial to start the conversation, even if initially maybe you don't quite say the right thing or in the quite right way, it's all about that intent and doing something is absolutely better than, than doing nothing. So it's about being allies, it's about using your voice and it's about demonstrating those behaviours that you um, would expect from others as well and 
touched on it again, but really important. It's all about improving the understanding across the organisation and for ourselves about the difference and, and how might we support um, our colleagues that, that may, may have uh, a spectrum condition. We can go on to, I think, tech tips. So I thought it'd be useful. Um, and this is just a tiny, tiny uh, number of um, technology apps and things that you can potentially use. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, but these are a few things that have, have, have been kind of suggested to, to me over, over time. Um, slightly odd name, but there, there is a, a, a fab little app called BrainToss. And what it does is essentially something on your phone that allows you to capture anything. You can take photographs, you can voice record, you can um, capture lots and lots of different data. And what it does, it sets up um, a rule to email you everything at the end of the day. So anything as you're going around your day to day, I mean, I think it's brilliant for everybody to be honest, um, but yeah, really useful way of capturing thoughts and things that, that, that come into your mind during the course of the day. Many people probably have heard of Scrivener, uh, originally created to help with writing, but it's also a really great tool to help with content. It's got a split screen that allows you to work on a document as well as the document that all of your reference materials. So it's a really good way of kind of getting the pool of everything you're wanting to work on. So it really helps with structuring some and, and the planning of, of some of the writing. Bullet journals, I haven't used them personally. Um, but I've heard from many people that the Ryder Carroll bullet journals are really great. Um, personally, again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you want to look at the Ryder Carroll um, uh, YouTube. They, they are quite long and, and, and not inspiring, particularly. Sorry, Ryder Carroll. But there are some fantastic people that do um, demonstrate the Ryder Carroll bullet journals really, really well. So it, it's something definitely worth having a look at. Then we've got all the mind mapping tools. There's a couple there um, as an example. But basically, it's, it's, it's considering what collaborative technology can be used um, across teams. And it's about talking to individuals as to what might better help them. So simple things are we have one at work, you know, WhatsApp and group chats for particular teams. It kind of captures conversations. Um, but it's, again, all down to you know, talking to teams, talking to individuals and, and how can they better, best use um, and capture information. And then I think we're on to the last slide, really, which is a bit of a, bit of a, um, a recap on, on the things to remember. Everyone's different, as we all are, and that's exactly the same for people with a neuro difference. How the condition and the behaviours are, are are presented are going to be absolutely different for everyone um, and because of that we shouldn't think that any adjustments are prescriptive because one person perhaps in the organization or within the team has found something really really beneficial it doesn't mean that the next person is going to have the same barriers or, or find that the answer it's brilliant to give examples um, of, of adjustments that have been made or software that's been provided to other colleagues that found them really helpful because we know that not everyone um, with a neuro difference necessarily knows what might help them. So sometimes it's a little bit of test, you know, have a look at this. Does this software work for you? Um, and and keep, keep looking for the best possible solution. And that's why we say as important as putting those adjustments in place, it's reviewing them. You know, it's not about coming up with a what we, we think is a, a solution to support someone. It's about ensuring that what we've put in place is actually removing those barriers and is working, um, working for, for those colleagues. And coming back to point two, the first step should be the organisation or the manager identifying that there is potentially a barrier it's not about relying on the individual to, to come forward and say, look, I need support here. It, it's absolutely um, the first step should be that we're supporting our colleagues if we think that there is a barrier. 
And that, I think, concludes uh, Dan and I's overview, very quick whistle-stop tour of, of um, ADHD and what it's like in the workplace. And that's predominantly because we wanted to um, get into answering all of your questions. So I think, am I handing back to yourself, Andy, now? Yeah, yeah, please. That's great. Dan Hazel, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I got I got a lot out of that, sort of 10, 15 minutes, a lot of things to, to digest and probably the most entertaining chat box we've had on a webinar for a long time as well. So thanks to everyone that's engaging in, in the conversation. Um, we've obviously, we've, we've had quite a few questions coming into this and, and uh, we had quite a few just talking about um, how we can support organisations uh, on the subject. And I feel this, this was something that was of value to, to go through quickly. So um, just to have a, a quick overview really of, of, of how we have helped a lot of organisations uh, over the last few months, years, so post rights enablement division, uh, so we can help and, and, and support by the way of a, a referral into ourselves from, from an organisation generally. Um, so we engage with many organisations and set up clear processes to help support colleagues and, and staff within the field. So we would receive a referral uh, from, from the, from the organisation about an individual. We can arrange a, a triage call if needed to gain an overview of the case and, and signpost an individual to the right assessment and, and also the right assessor, which when, when someone is, is having an, a, an assessment, we feel making sure that the individual has the right assessor in place as well is a real key part of the process. Uh, so this is dependent on the information that we receive. So in, in these circumstances, obviously with the subject that, that we're talking about, we, we generally would do either a, a workplace needs assessment, which would be an assessment specific to the individual in their job role to make recommendations uh, as, as to what that person needs to do their job to the best of their ability. Uh, so it, it was really interesting. Hazel touched on it as well in terms of, of, of the barriers. So, so within this assessment, we're looking at the barriers and, and looking at what this person potentially may, may need, if, if anything, to, to help them do their job. Or we can do an ADHD screening assessment, which looks specifically at the individual and any traits that individual may have to ADHD. So this, screener will be more detailed to the potential condition and in what areas in terms of an individual strength so may look at problem solving um, the individual hard working need for stimulation and need for being kept busy those kind of traits uh, and it will look into any challenging areas where the individual may need further support uh, it would also signpost an individual to seek a referral via a gp for confirmation of adhd and any potential uh, medical treatment which again we've, we've touched on uh, so there, um, there are obviously other assessments in there which cover other disabilities and neurological conditions within the division, which we can speak uh, to you separately should you wish. It's obviously not just uh, not just ADHD that we, we would cover. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and secondly, uh, what the potential outcomes would be. Um, we, we, we have touched on this being an individual, uh, you know, case by case basis. That we, we've had a few queries, and I get asked quite a lot on what, what, what is good for an individual with ADHD and, and I'll always respond to say we need to we need to understand more we, it's not a blanket question that you can answer uh, we need to understand what that person's what, what that person's doing what what their individual barriers are and then put put, uh, put them on the right pathway uh, so to speak so um, the recommendations would come post uh, assessment so we would look at one of those individual assessments and and that would detail what the next steps will be to help the individual should there be recommendations made so this could be assistive technology it could be ergonomic solutions sit stand desks for example uh, one of the main recommendations we make is one to one strategy coaching just to have that close support over a number of sessions this can include co coaching so it would bring in an individual's line manager to discuss clear ways of working going forward and how that how certain things may impact an individual or an individual that works within a team uh, and we can also run various types of training depending on whether recommendations are ergonomic or assistive technology related uh, and and, uh, and and talk about a uh, good practice as well um, that has been touched on within the presentation given an individual extra extra time for example even where they're situated within an open plan office can have an impact as well so um, we also we run a lot of remote awareness sessions. We have done a lot over the last couple of years um, with, 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 the, with the move to a lot of remote sessions makes it a lot easier for organisations. So 
This will be for either individuals or whole organisations really understanding the impact this may have in the workplace and in an individual's life. So we, we've done a lot of, uh, of awareness training. So we do have all this information to hand as there may be a few questions on, on certain aspects of this. So we can uh, we can send this out to you. But if, if there are any specific queries, I'd encourage you to reach out to either myself or if you have an account manager that you generally deal with, reach out to them to discuss this in more detail. Uh, we can fit in with your current process um, or, or we can help set up a clear process allowing an individual to gain the support they need to do the job to the best of their ability. The next slide, please. So just on, on the back of that as well, we've obviously got quite a lot of it, it, people engaging within, within the webinar and um, just, just something that we want to, uh, we want to, to do to sort of re reward the organisations that are, that are engaging in the conversation um, it is to to get in touch with myself in terms of, of, of um, if you're interested in the assessment side uh, and learning more. We've got the first 50 organisations to contact us that, that get a reduction in the assessment, which will, will always help. Um, and, and that just gives a, a little overview, really, in terms of uh, which assessments they are, the workplace needs, which I've mentioned, and, and, the, uh, and the ADHD screen and assessment. So if that is something that you do want to discuss, uh, then either get in touch with, with the enablement at postrite.co.uk email address or uh, or with myself, which I think my details are coming up uh, very shortly. Um, so, yeah, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, we, we've had a few questions. I will certainly try my best to, to delve through them. Uh, there, were, there are a few that were, were sent in in advance uh, as, as well, and there may be a bit of repetition within some of the questions just because there's obviously big, bigger subjects around this. So I'll invite the rest of the panel um to 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 maybe uh appear again and and uh, and I'll, I'll sort of feel feel them and feel free to to sort of jump in guys in terms of, of of wanting to respond so the first one we've had is how can an employer or colleagues support individuals with adhd do you want to... i was just gonna say i i can take it or do you want to take it down i'm just seeing i'll just and done a lot of speaking but we can both take it perhaps <laughs> i think i I'm, I'm more than happy to kick off on this i think what can an organization do well essentially it's um a number you know where, where do we start but um it's understanding neurodifference it's understanding um how colleagues may uh what those barriers might look like so it's a real education piece both from leadership, but also with hiring managers and colleagues, because as I said before, it's about everybody being able to have that shift in culture as to how we support colleagues that are perhaps facing barriers. So it's, it's upskilling, it's raising awareness of, of a newer difference, basically a non-visible disability, which has become more and more in in our, our thinking um, about how do we support colleagues that have non visible and we know neuro difference is, is a big percentage of that. Um, and it's also having really good robust policies and practices in place because you have to have good guidance, you have to have that guidance available so everyone in the organisation knows where to go for that best practice and that guidance. And you know, that combined with giving people the skills and the confidence to have those conversations will over time create a shift in, in culture and make sure that, you know, the, the discussion happens and the awareness is raised and essentially people are getting the adjustments that they need. Um, Dan, I'm sure you can add maybe to that or if, if that's answered it I don't know uh, yeah no I'd, I'd double down on that yeah particularly with policy um, we see a lot of organizations with excellent policy but then it's about guidance for individuals in roles how are they actually supposed to be using that policy so uh, just because you have a tremendous policy around workplace adjustments for instance how do your uh, management team know how to use that um um, how do they know to have a conversation with individual colleagues so just one other point I was going to raise there about um, being able to support with some organizations using things like uh, disability passports or just uh, tailored working plans so again that almost actually takes the conversation away from just being about disability but about being able to support every individual um, 
what are your what are your needs so if your manager changes or if you change role within the organization uh what sort of uh needs do you have uh, perhaps you have a, a long-term health condition as well so different things that uh affect that could affect or impact your work um then that means that that conversation is encouraged because you have this um passport which is documented and recorded throughout your life cycle within an organization and it is a responsibility of the uh employer your line manager to be having that conversation and to be regularly reviewing that as well so david i saw you come off a of mute i didn't know if you had something to add as well so i don't take all the time no no i've pretty much covered it with that so no. <laughs> the only thing i was going to add to that is it's, it's also recognizing that not all individuals with a neurodifference will necessarily identify as being disabled. And that's why best practice approach is that we do look at barriers to performance rather than always assuming that we need that diagnosis. But as I said earlier, you know, having diagnosis and understanding the condition for many is also a really important step on their journey to understanding how they um, how they process information slightly differently and, 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 and how they can adopt certain practices to, to, to really, you know, bring their, their skills to the fore. But that is an important thing that, you know, an organisation, it's about approaching those barriers because if we always start everything with the disability, then some individuals won't, won't recognise that that might be them and they could be supported under that so it's just it's just something to think about fantastic thanks guys um another question we have is maybe one for you dave actually what support can an individual with no access to technology in work receive we, we look we seem like we've got a large proportion of people on the call that actually may work in manufacturing sectors etc where um, you know there's, there's no assumption here that everyone's sat in front of a laptop all day every day and, and there's a lot of job roles where um, things like you know we're talking about assistive technology as a be a solution it is it isn't doesn't even come into into the job role so is there anything that people without access to technology um would, would would look at receiving yeah i think i think it's it's already been mentioned about um looking at the environment rather than the individual which is the key thing um what is their working environment obviously there's there's multiple and it's it's difficult to pin down each individual one uh, without looking at each case but yeah, you've got to look at the environment that you're working in, um, look at the then um, what changes can be made in that environment. Obviously, we've, we've seen mention in the chat about headsets and things like that to reduce noise around people. Obviously, that's got to be looked at in a health and safety case as well. Um, but other things, you know, other, other um, supporting tools. Um, I was in a, a workshop uh, kind of supporting um, ADHD uh, awareness session a few weeks back. And... Um, the chap was constantly on his mobile because that's an attention grabber. And that's one of the things that we all do these days. We're looking at our mobile and then you go from one thing to another to another on the mobile, your attention is gone. Uh, and it can completely distract. So just simple things like putting that away, uh, having it in a locker or having it on silent and then just looking at it during the breaks. So the process is really, um, and they can be uh, kind of taught to people. So um, putting in those kind of support solutions by maybe coping strategies, uh, those kind of solutions can help in each individual case. Um, and then uh, we've seen other things mentioned about keeping people busy as well while they're actually working. So there's things like clicker tools um, where they can actually click all the squeezy balls, those kind of things uh, can help, you know, focus their mind away from uh, those distractions as well. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of different so solutions, but you've got to look at them individually, really. Fantastic. Um, we, we've spoke within the presentation as well, uh, Hazel. You mentioned it about about lang how important language is and, and, and sensitivity has been been mentioned. So there's a question about: Is there any advice on how to approach the topic of ADHD with someone who you think may have the condition? Yeah, I mean, Dan. I think Dan's probably got some some uh, thoughts on that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, I, to be honest, it does go back to this thing about thinking about barriers and and we're not trying. I think as soon as we start talking about um, that, that, that's almost like thinking about in terms of making a manager or uh, employ someone that is almost going out to diagnose, which is uh, it becomes quite a tricky situation. Nothing that actually causes a lot of issues and a lot of 
um, problems around having confidence to be able to approach people because it does, it's exactly this stumbling block. You're like, how do I approach this in terms of language, in terms of talking about someone maybe just like disabled? That's very much for that individual. It's not for you as a colleague or as an employee. For you there, it's about being able to recognize barriers, recognizing where things might not be working and being able to have a conversation around um, you know, what expectations are and how can we help you to be able to fulfill your potential. We have a similar conversation around um, mental health in the workplace as well, where it's noticing traits. So it might be in someone's behavior, it might be in someone's um, quality of work, it could be in, in how their day-to-day -day is being impacted. And it isn't then about going and having a direct conversation or trying to diagnose any particular condition or, or anything around their mental health. It's about saying, having a delicate conversation around how can we help you is there is there anything that you need from us and being able to offer those sorts of things i, I think we get bogged down a little bit too much and then trying to um, diagnose so just very briefly in my previous work with national autistic society a lot of things that we would do around training around autism one of the kickbacks from that would be quite often as people left you'd hear little conversations of oh i think so and so is on the spectrum and that isn't what you're trying to encourage this is about trying to get that wider awareness not so people can then go out and diagnose but can offer help through being able to offer different things that they can within work um, and through their networks and um, being able to have a conversation without having to pull that information from an individual and i think i was just going to add it's really important that we don't overthink these things. Being a good performance manager is being a good performance manager of all people. It is not different for individuals that may or may not have a disability or may or may not have a year of difference. So Dan's absolutely right. What it is important though, is that you, you know what you've identified as potentially a performance concern and you structure the conversation appropriately around that. So the kind of language is, you know, we have, I have noticed that you've missed a number of deadlines or I have noticed that, um, you know, you're not at your desk as much as you were or, you know, the, the practical things that you have identified that may be contributing to performance not being where you want it to be. So you kind of have the conversation around the things that you've identified and then that, that triggers the conversation as to, are there things that we can do to support you to, to help you with hitting those deadlines with maybe some time management? Is there a reason why you sh you know, you're finding that more challenging? You will then start to tease out and those individuals that may be aware um, or have a diagnosis perhaps haven't shared, that would come out in the conversation, but it, it, as Dan said, it's if we talk about diagnosis, if we talk about conditions, that can be quite a fear factor for people because they're thinking, my gosh, I don't know anything about this condition or how on earth can I support somebody? It's basically as a good performance manager, how do you support all of your employees? And the rest will naturally come. Fantastic. This probably takes it back, back a little stage. You need to send a message in about what advice would you give to someone who when applying for a job, preparing for an interview, or when starting a new job in terms of asking for reasonable adjustments. This is always a, a conversation we have a lot in terms of whether people uh, feel comfortable enough to disclose um, personal details when, when, they're, when they're interviewing for a job. Um, it, it's probably something that's, that's, that's still a big conversation at the minute. So any advice on, on applying for a job, uh, preparing for an interview, and I suppose that, that, that sort of umbrellas, that neurodiversity um, a subject as well rather than specifically just ADHD? My recommendation to anyone applying for a role is do your research you know does the brand does the website does it talk about inclusivity and accessibility does it offer um, invitation for you to talk about any adjustments reasonable adjustments you might require in the interview and application process if there's no mention of that then it's not a given, but it's likely that your experience once you join the organisation is going to be or could be problematic. Because if, if the attraction and the uh, interview and, and the onboarding process is not accessible and, and adjustments aren't readily available, that possibly translates to what it would be like in the workplace. So do your research. Um, 
organisations that are very aware of accessibility and, and, and wanting to be as barrier free as possible will be talking about please you know please ask, you know speak to us and um, email us phone us if you um, feel that there's some adjustments that we could make to the application process or the interview process um, if you do get to, to the, the the point where you are selected for interview then it's making sure that you you ask or you're provided with the right information or thorough information on what the process is going to be because if you know what the process is going to be you're more likely to understand whether there's going to be a barrier and therefore you can ask um, you might say this sometimes has been a, you know a challenge for me when i've been assessed in this way is it possible have you provided these adjustments in the past um, is this something that's reasonable so it's about having those conversations but it's also thinking about you know, it's, it's kind of a 50-50 responsibility. You, you need to be um, open to having the conversations about what's going to work for you. Because as we said, everyone's different. And even though an employer might have put some things in place for someone, that might not be the best adjustment for you. So it's kind of, you know, select who you're going to apply for, but don't be don't be scared. If, if you feel that you don't want to talk about it because you might have some discrimination, is that an organisation that you want to work for anyway? So I would say always ask because if you, if you don't share that information because you have that fear, you know, there's a reason to, to maybe apply for organisations that are very much um, inclusive and um, have those more barrier, barrier free processes. I'll just briefly add to that as well. I'd check out the affiliations. Are they a member of VDF? Um, are they uh, disability confident? Uh, all of that information is out there as well. So uh, see what work they've already done in the field, if you like. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, Graham sent a message in. Once reasonable adjustments are made, how often should they be reviewed and readjusted? Uh, we find the new way of working may drift into the norm and then lose focus again. So... Um, how, how often are we are we reviewing and, and readjusting people that have been given uh, workplace adjustments? I think for me that that does sort of depend a little bit on what the the adjustment is, but it's a, as well about making sure that you recognise that once the adjustment has been put in place, that is a reset. That's a beginning again. So it isn't this should immediately slip into uh, this individual is now totally helped this is this is you know this is now we need to judge whether this um this uh adjustment is working and it all again comes back into that part and parcel of it being the up to a line manager and having a, a set workplace adjustment process to make sure they are checking in with the individual see how they are feeling um so david don't know if you want to add to that I think yeah, I think I think like you say, it's an ongoing process. It's not something you you just do it as a let's do it every quarter or you know it's it's definitely needs reviewing straight away. See if the uh, they're actually working. Maybe within a month, you know, at the process, especially with technology, you know, technology might not always be the best thing. Maybe they've not taken up the training on the technology, which is key, you know. So if they do actually um, start to use it, but again, keeping the line manager involved so they know you know are those strategies actually working. It's not an overnight switch that. Everything's going to be, you know, uh, as good as they're expecting. So, yeah, I'd say I'd say keeping it regular, um, review it as as you would, you know, the the general working practices really, um, and just make it the norm rather than being a, a special thing that you do. Definitely. And absolutely, if there's a change in role or a change in environment, so it could be the same role but different building, different location, um, you know, the barriers are around the environment, aren't they? Not always just the individual so it's really important that an adjustment that you might need to deliver a particular set of um, activities might be very different when, when you change roles so always when you change roles as well that's great we've got a question and um, there's a couple uh, queries come up with with access to work sarah sent a question does your service replace the need for access to work or is that a separate process um I might jump in if that's all right, Dave. You might you might add add as well. Uh, obviously, because because it, it's the process that that, that we have. Um, it it doesn't replace access to work, but it can work alongside it. it well, it can replace access to it should you want it to. 
Um, so posture right, the assessment will very much uh, be very similar, probably to the access to work assessment. Um, I think the main differences between using posture right and using access to work would be um, that there's uh, with, with the assessment side, the referral would come from the organisation rather than the individual, which obviously with access to work, the individual applies to access to work. However, should you want to use access to work for the assessment, then you can still come to Posturite for any reasonable adjustments that are recommended. So that obviously doesn't affect any funding. They'll put recommendations down there that uh, as long as you, you, you implement those recommendations, then that, that get, that's, that's, you still get allocated that funding. So um, it's quite a big conversation, access to work. We could probably run a webinar on, on how access to work functions and how you guys use it um, all, all in itself. Um, so if there are specific access to work questions, then... Uh, feel free to come to myself, but we do liaise with 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 uh, the access to work um, organisations quite frequently, actually. So we, we you know we work with them uh, quite a lot, and uh, and 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 yeah, just uh, just just yeah. If you want any more assistance with that, then then just let me know. Um, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to kind of merge together, if that's okay. One of them that came in that says, "How does one get a reasonable diagnosis for older people?" Uh, it doesn't designate what age bracket that is, um, who have been developing coping strategies that I would assume would skew testing. And we've had another one that said, can ADHD develop later in life, as for example, as an after effect of PT, uh, PTSD or something similar. So uh, maybe people that, are, uh, that, that, that over time, have, over the last 20 years, have, have, have been managing the situation themselves and develop coping strategies, or is it something that can develop later, later in life? So it is a developmental, so we know that ADHD is something, you know, the spectrum conditions are from birth and they are lifelong. I think where the question is probably coming from is that often through coping strategies, it can be masked and it can be masked for many, many years. Um, females are much better at masking in their early years, be just because of the way they develop compared to boys, let's say. So quite often, females are diagnosed a lot later. Um, I've got personal experience of, of that in terms of, you know, my, uh, my daughter um, has had a very recent diagnosis of ADHD, um, inattention, not with hyperactivity, and she's almost 20. Um, she hasn't just developed ADHD, she has had it since, you know, from birth, but it has been masked and it's come through in other ways. And sometimes, you know, we don't, we don't always want to assume certain behaviours um, are linked to necessarily having a condition. And it's not always important that, that you, you, you know or you give things a label. So, um, it, it is something that you don't suddenly get it. You don't suddenly um, you know, find that you have the condition. It's just that through circumstance, through environment, through masking and those, um, those tools that you've adopted, sometimes it's not as obvious and sometimes it maybe comes to you. The more you hear of other people um, having certain traits and behaviours and they go, oh, you know, I've... I've, I've just found out, you know, I've got ADHD. And even that sometimes people think, well, actually, that sounds a bit like me. Same with dyslexia, you know, same with uh, autism. They are spectrum conditions. So um, if, you're, if, if, if it impacts you slightly less um, significantly, then, then you may not come to recognise it until much later. Fantastic. We, we've had a, a couple of comments really as well, which I think are worth mentioning around the uh, job opportunities and interviewing uh, section to say that that uh, an individual has, has, has mentioned about missing out on job opportunities. Um, and then uh, further down, apologies, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, things that, to, to go through. Um, I think it, it, it was um, it may it, 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 an individual that basically said that people, someone that they know went for an interview or their organization were giving the interview questions out prior to the interview taking place. And we talk about coping mechanisms and that doesn't necessarily generally have to be um, just for interviews, does it? You know, we're talking generally here that, that those nice little easy adjustments, very straightforward. You talk about common sense in, in these situations and it just seems like it makes sense, doesn't it? And it's just a nice tip really. In, 
it, it's not just for a, an interviewee to ask for the questions, but also for an organization to say, do you need a copy of the of, of the interview questions prior to it taking place? And uh, I just thought it was something that, that is, is a nice thing to uh, to, to, to mention. Um, we, we, I know we're running out of time, um, so I'm, I'm just going to um, go to one that, uh, that, that's been sent in about how, Sylvain asked this, how can you get a formal diagnosis? The diagnosis, I know we touched on in terms of concentrating on the barriers, um, but is, is, is what's the sort of official way to, to get a formal diagnosis? Hazel, Dan, or, or, or David, if anybody oh, sorry, wants to. I thought David was going to put that. No, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I think it's important to, to say that, you know, there is no medical test for this. You know, you don't, you don't have a blood test or you don't, you know, and oh, yeah, you, you've definitely got ADHD. So it's about the discussion. It's about that those diagnostic tools that experts um, will use to identify uh, known barriers, known behaviours um, that, that is essentially giving them the information to make a professional expert judgment. Um, and those are, you know, organisations you've just seen, obviously, Posturite have, um, have that, that available to do a diagnostic assessment. And that diagnostic assessment will then give you, if you're 25 and under, um, I think it is you, um, or if, if you're in, in, in education still, um, that diagnosis, for example, will be sufficient to give to um, uh, student finance and you can get DSA, Disability Student um, Allowance. That diagnosis from someone like Costrite will be enough to get support you need, certainly for young people um, going through the education. Um, some not not many but some organizations might want to do a diagnosis and that's not necessarily because you won't get support if you don't have it but they may feel that they can better support you if they've got more understanding and that's because once you've got a diagnosis then part of that is that needs assessment and the needs assessment is the thing that's really really helpful to identify how you learn how you work um and those things that are recommended to be put in place to support you. So it might be a particular laptop, might be particular software um, and those kinds of things. So David, I'm sure you have got some. Yeah, I just, I just want to add that we, we within our um, screening, we don't actually um, cover the medical side of diagnostics. Uh, that would be down to the NHS or, or private. So um, we wouldn't actually cover any recommendation on medical. Um, solution. So uh, yes, we can do the screening and, and give recommendations and, and support from the back of that. That's great. Thanks, guys. And and, and maybe maybe lastly, I know we, we push for time. Uh, Dave, this may be for yourself because I know you've done a lot over the last few months on awareness training. Uh, how how best do we educate and inform managers? Uh, this is a comment. I've sadly seen ADHD treated as a time management issue with the application of strict timings, deadlines, and micro management. Um, so anything about ed education, informing line managers, line managers have a lot of responsibility and uh, how, how, do we, how do we get that message out and educate? Yeah, we, we can deliver um, an actual uh, line manager training uh, session. Uh, it's become quite a popular request now. Uh, the, the session will cover uh, a lot of what we talked about today. So the, the, all the different hidden neurodiverse conditions, um, how to recognize them, how to um, approach somebody and give them that support. Um, what are reasonable adjustments, the legalities of it, the limitations of it, um, and then some of the uh, solutions off the back of that. So things like the technology and the coping strategies that we've been talking about today as well. Um, but we cover uh, a little bit more in depth on, on those solutions. So it gives the line manager uh, a lot of insight into the conditions, um, but also how to support individuals and be more proactive rather than reactive um, and put a lot of the tools in place that we've been talking about the environment rather than individual so yeah quite a, an important uh, training session that we can we can offer fantastic that's great i know we, we're tipping over time i wonder if tom whether we could get that sort of last slide on with all our contact details and and just i think there's obviously still quite a few comments and questions that come in and there's quite specific queries so i'm going to share them with the team after the webinar 
and then one of us will come back to you. So we will respond to all, all, um, all questions and all comments. Um, if there is anything specific, as I say, we, we're going to put our contact details up now. Please contact us direct. It, it leaves me to say thank you to, to Hazel, to Dan, to David for, for, for engaging with us. Um, a really good response. And thank you to everyone. There's a lot of kind comments in the, in, in the chat box. So thank you to everyone that's, that's, uh, that's engaged with us and, and made comments and shared good practice within the chat box. It's, it's fantastic to, to see this kind of interest and, and awareness. And I think it, it, it's it's almost seems like it's you know there's still a, still a long way to go generally and, and, and sessions like today can only help so uh yeah thank you for myself if anyone else wants to add any comments but I, as i say our contact details are on there should you wish to get in touch with us all i was gonna mention andy was if if anyone wants to check whether their business is already a, a member of bdf you can do that by going to businessdisabilityforum.org.uk and under our membership section you will be able to see if your organization is already a member or a partner um, and if they are that means you can register and you can get access to much of our, our content so take a look um, and, and see whether you can get, get access to that fantastic that's great thank you everyone have a great day and uh, yeah hopefully we'll speak to a lot of you very soon thank you thanks thank you. bye